Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. Good morning to everyone present here in the sanctuary and also you who are watching online. Glad to have you here with us today. Uh, let's start with a scripture. Uh, I brought a scripture for you just for us to keep in mind and focus our attention uh, as we read from uh, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens and praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. What brings to my mind is not only, I believe not only I had a great week, but I believe you had a blessed week in God's company and his protection. Not only you and your family. And this time I'd like to invite you to bow your heads as we invite the presence of God in the midst of us. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your presence, thanking you for the blessings we received throughout this past week, for the, the seen and the unseen blessings you bestowed upon us, for the experience of your faithfulness and your love and your mercies. We praise your name. We glorify you. And we will come and sing songs of praises unto your name, O oh Lord. Now we pray for the presence of your spirit as, as claiming the promise of the scripture when two or three are together, we, we worship you in truth and spirit. Bless us, we pray. May this moment of worship, may the service, may the message be inspiring and be uplifting and comforting to our hearts and spirit. We pray these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. We worship the Lord, and one of the ways for us to praise him is by being faithful to him, as he's been faithful to us always. Um, in, in, an, in, two we in three weeks from now, three weekends from now, we'll no longer be worship in this place. Uh, God has moved us to a different location, and we will be worshiping and, uh, uh, at Grow Life uh, beginning March 2nd, the first Sabbath of March. And we'd like you to make sure, take a picture of that. The address is over there. And so we are going to worship there on the first Sabbath of March. Which day are worshiping there? First Sa Mar Sabbath of March. There you go. So join us over there, and, uh, and uh, also uh, let's, let's continue planning uh, our transition there uh, so that I would say go to the Google and figure it out the distance from your home to the church, okay? Uh, this moment I'd like to encourage you to be uh, faithful to God and your worship as we present to him not only our hearts, our our spirit or our soul, but also we present to God the faithfulness of what he has given us. And this is the time where we bring our tithe and offerings. Uh, if you point your camera to that QR code, you'll be able to uh, um, provide to God what he has given to you. Um, and shortly after this, now we'll begin with our children's story. And we have our children's story here. Is that you? Okay. All right, friends. Don't leave me hanging. Come on, kids. It's your time. promise I am a possibility I am a promise with the capital P I am a great big bundle of potentiality and I am learning to hear God's voice and I am trying I'm trying just to make the right choice I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be Yay! Good morning! Good morning! 
<laughs> How are you guys? I'm super excited to be with you guys this morning. I've been praying for you guys all week long and asking God, okay, God, what do, what do you want me to tell the children? And he told me on Wednesday night, he told me. And he wants me to talk to you guys about sowing and reaping. Does anyone know what sowing is? Anyone? What do you think it is? Is it, is it the one like where someone sows like something? Someone sows like something? Like they're stitching up? Oh, that's a great thought. So like sewing, stitching clothes? That's a different kind of sewing. Spelled differently too. So today I'm going to teach you a new kind of sewing. This sowing means to plant or to scatter seeds, okay? So you learned a new word today. That's great. What about reap? Does anyone know what that means? Reap? Now that's a tricky one. It means to cut or gather the harvest. So if I sow the seeds, they're going to grow, and then I'm going to reap all of those things that grew from my harvest. It also means to receive a reward for your action. So I'm going to show you some pictures that I think might help you understand this a little bit better. So for example, if I have these apple seeds and I sow them, what do you think I'm going to reap? An apple tree, that's right. If I sow apple seeds, I'm going to reap an apple tree. That's, that's sowing and reaping. But you know, with sowing and reaping, it can also do with our character, our heart. So like, for example, if I sow kindness, what do you think I might reap? If I sow kindness, I might reap friends. I might have people who think, oh, she's really nice. I want to be her friend. Or if, I re or if I sow really good work, if I work really, really hard in school, I might reap the benefits of being able to be whatever I want to be when I grow up. But do you know that sowing and reaping also work in the opposite way, the negative way? For example, if I sow unkindness or meanness, what do you think I'm going to reap? No more friends. I'm going to be lonely. I'm going to have no, no friends. So today I want to talk to you, because when I think about sowing and reaping, I actually think about a really important black historian. And February is Black History Month. And it's a time where we honor and we celebrate the contributions of African Americans and their achievements to our country. And I think about this man right here, Junius G. Groves. Have you guys ever heard of him? He was a potato farmer. How many of you guys like french fries? OK, potatoes, french fries, yes, mashed potatoes, all the yummy things, baked potatoes. Junius G. Groves was a potato farmer. And he was born into slavery. But, oh, a few things, a few things, because I have, I have so many things, y'all, so many things. So these are, what are these? They're actually beans. But can you use your imagination and pretend they're potatoes? Okay, great, because it was going to take like millions of potatoes for me to help you understand what happened here. So these are potatoes. What are they? Potatoes. I know. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. So they're potatoes. So when you see them, just think potatoes. So Junius G. Groves, he was born into slavery. But then when slavery was abolished, he moved away from his mom to Kansas. It's a state far away from here. And he began to work on a potato farm. He got a job working on a potato farm. And you know how much he made a day? 40 cents a day, like four dimes, guys. Four dimes, that's it. Do you guys have money? You have a lot of money. Well, Junius G. Groves did not have a lot of money. But you know what happened? He sowed good seeds. He sowed hard work, and he reaped the benefits of getting a raise. Do you guys know what a raise is? It means he got more money. He got 75 cents. And then he kept sewing hard work, and he got a raise again. But with his raise, his boss made him the foreman, which means the boss or the manager of the entire farm. And then he started making $1.25. But Junius G. Groves, you know what he wanted? He wanted his own farm. He didn't want to work for somebody else. He wanted his own farm. So he said, hey, to his boss, can I rent or borrow some of your land and grow some crops? And the boss thought, you know what? He's a hard worker. Yes, sure, I'll rent you some land. And he told him, with the land that I rent you, 
you're going to pay me back in potatoes, in crop. So Junius G. Groves, he worked really hard, and he was able to pay for that land that he borrowed with some potatoes. Is this a lot of potatoes? Not quite, but it was enough to pay him back. But you know what? He asked for more land. And because he had showed, he had sowed that good seed of being a hard worker and reaped the benefits of being able to pay his boss back, his boss gave him more land. And he was able to reap even more harvest, more harvest, more potatoes. What are these? Potatoes, right? But you know, over time, Ginny Street Groves worked so incredibly hard. He sowed good seed. He got up every day. He watered his plants and they grew and grew and grew more potatoes, that he bought 500 acres of his own land. 500 acres, that's a lot. He saved up all his money, bought his own farm, and he grew millions of potatoes. Millions of potatoes, and he supplied those potatoes to everyone in our country, everywhere in our country, and Mexico, and Canada. He's actually called the potato king of the world crazy, right? Hope you learned something new today. And just because I am a literacy teacher, if you want to read more about Junie Street Groves, go to your library and ask to read this book, No Small Potatoes. A great book. No Small Potatoes. But you guys, you know what I think is most important? Junie Street Groves really understood this Bible verse. Can somebody read this for me? Can you read it for me? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Galatians 6, verse 7. Amen. He understood this promise that God made us. This is a promise, but we have to do our part, right? It's a conditional promise, which means I have to sow good seed so I can reap the benefits of good. Did he sow good seed? Yes, and he reaped the benefits of that. But, you know, just like the farmer that plants the apple seeds and reaps the benefits of this beautiful apple tree, God is the ultimate farmer. He's the farmer that created all the things. And you know what he sowed to the earth? He sowed his son, Jesus. He gave us his son, Jesus. And when we choose to follow and obey him, he's going to reap the benefits of us being able to spend eternal life with him. How many of you want to spend eternal life with Jesus? Yeah, you want to go to heaven and spend Eternal life with Jesus, amen. Well, before we pray, I have lots of things for you because that's how I operate here. So I have this cool coloring sheet with a potato farm, and you can see the verse at the bottom that helps you remember what we learned today. But on the back, it says sowing and reaping. And I want you to think about your time today or in your quiet time when you're at home. What are the seeds you're going to sow this week? What are the seeds you're going to sow? Maybe you need to sow studying for your math test so you can reap the benefits of getting an A. Maybe you need to sow helping mom out so you can reap the benefits of a really happy mom who has time to spend time with you. <laughs> All those things. So think about what you're going to sow and you're going to reap. And then I have some potatoes. And you're like, Miss Yoli, what in the world? You're giving me potatoes? Yes. I'm giving you potatoes, and potatoes, there's all different kinds of potatoes. There's these purple potatoes, delish, red potatoes, yummy. I have some white potatoes, and I'm giving you potatoes, and what I want you to do is I want you to go home, and I want you to cook some potatoes. You can make french fries in your air fryer. You can make mashed potatoes, but while you're cooking your potatoes and putting in that hard work to reap the benefits of eating the potatoes, I want you to think about Junius G. Groves and the work he did to be able to give us potatoes like these, but most importantly, I want you to think about how God wants us to sow good seed. Amen? Can somebody pray for me? You want to pray? Anyone? Okay, I'll pray. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you remind us that you have a promise where we will reap what we sow, God. And I pray that as we go about our week, we would reap, sow good seed so that we could reap the benefits that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for the reminder that you've sowed your son into the earth and that you want to be able to reap the benefits of spending eternal life with us. I pray for these children here as they go about their week. Guide them, protect them, and keep them safe. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, guys.
doing all the things. <laughs> all right, guys, this is part of the service where we get to give back to God. Amen. So I'm actually going to invite you to stand with us. And I'm just going to pray us into this time. It was a week for me. It was, it was a rough one. But God is faithful, and he has built in this time for us to rest. And I, I feel like as a kid, I did not take advantage of that time. And as an adult, I'm really learning to embrace it and to love it and to be just so grateful for the Sabbath. So as we sing these songs about understanding that God is a good, good father and that he does what he says he's going to do, and we are who he says we are, let us pray. Father God, Lord, I just thank you that You've given us this Sabbath. I thank you, Lord, that we have this time to stop and to worship you. So as we surrender our hearts now in this moment through worship and praise, I just pray that you would fill our spirits, encourage us, let us feel your presence in this place. In the name of Jesus, amen.
strives to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Oh, 
judge in the sun and give source to his light. Yeah, conceal it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom indescribable, uncontainable. You'll place the stars in the sky and you'll know them by name. You are amazing. Struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Sing it again, indescribable. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God. He's all powerful. Oh, powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you'll see the depths of my heart and you love me the same, you are amazing. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I love by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Say it again. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. church you're good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are It's who I am. It's who I am. 
perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to Your glory, God, is what 
again, there's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. It's in your presence, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen, yeah. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Hallelujah Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit Holy Spirit You are welcome here Come plant this place church. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Excited to be here with you guys this morning. 
I want to uh, I want to tell you that I'm I'm very very honored to be the pastor of this amazing group of you, amazing group of people, and it's an honor to be here and, and share God's word with you. I'm here to to love you, to serve you, and to point you to Jesus Christ. That's my mission here, and uh, hopefully. Uh, you will see that as uh, weeks and months go by. I'm going to invite you to, to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father God, want to thank you that we, broken as we are, wayward as we can be, that we can come before your presence in prayer and invite you to take over our lives, invite you to restore us to you, invite you to, to lead us and to guide us. And this morning, we, we echo what the song says. We want your presence to be here. We want you to fill uh, this whole place, your Holy Spirit, to, to impact the atmosphere here in and our hearts as well. We pray, Father God, that as we open your word, that you will speak to each and every one of us. In Christ Jesus, amen. So guys, so, so for those of you who want a more comfortable seat, there's a bunch of seats here in the front. You're welcome. These are more comfortable, okay? Just, just an invitation. No, no. Just an invitation. So, so Sunday night football has 18 million viewers every Sunday night, and that's coming to the end tomorrow with the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is a finale. And, and one of the most shocking things about pro football, to me, is that the quarterback, the captain of the team, doesn't get to choose what the next play is. Did you know that? It's a coach who tells the quarterback when to pass and when to run. So it's interesting to me because a successful quarterback is one who is humble enough to listen to the guy who's standing on the sidelines telling him what to do and has the ability to carry out those orders quickly and without complaint. We often look at the quarterback as a leader who, who, who carries a team into the championship and in a way he does, but only when he listens to the coach and willingly follows his instruction. So here's the point of what I'm trying to say, and there was that shot. Don't expect, don't expect to win games or make the pros if you don't listen to your coach. Don't expect to get A's and a passing grade if you're not doing your homework and doing what your teacher is asking of you. Don't expect to get a raise or a promotion at work if you're not doing what your boss is asking of you. Don't expect to recover from your injury or your illness if you're not following your doctor's orders. Don't expect it to go well for you if you're not honoring, respecting your parents and doing what they're asking you to do. And don't expect to grow spiritually if you don't do what God is asking you to do. Now, none of these things, none of these things sound fun because who wants to do what other people are asking us to do? Who wants to obey other people's orders? We only want to do what we want to do. Isn't that true? Nobody wants to be told what to do. But obedience to someone who is wiser and greater than us, someone who loves us and has invested in us, will open the door of success for us. The right coach the loving father, the wise teacher, the financial advisor will open the doors 
or what can help us succeed if we listen and obey. Listen to this. The first duty of every man is to find their master. This sounds so foreign, doesn't it, to us Americans? Doesn't this sound so foreign? The first duty of every man is to find their master. Nobody's my master. I am my own master is what, how we think, how we Americans think. But the truth is that we all have a master. And the truth is, if Jesus is not your master, then who is your master? Isn't it your desires, your wants, your ambitions, your selfish goals? And if it's not what's coming out of here, then it's some other broken human being just like you who will become your master. But we all have our master. We all obey someone or something. Even Jesus chose to obey the Father. Every day, Jesus chose to bend his life. Listen to this. He chose to bend his life to the will of the Father. Every day, he checked in with the Father just like a quarterback checks in with the coach to figure out his next move. In fact, the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says that Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. This was the plan. This was the goal. For Jesus to die for you and I. And even though death seems like a defeat, it was actually a victory. And it's the victory that becomes our victory. I have chosen Jesus as my, as my master, but I have to confess to you that I'm not a very good follower. I'm not a very good student of Jesus because I'm hard-headed. I like to do things my way. Anybody with me? But I have learned that when I do obey, things go well with me. I guess if we put it in NFL terms or in football uh, terms, when I do what my teacher, what my master do, tells me to do, I make first downs. I reach the end zone. I make, I score. I win games. His simple requests, Jesus' simple requests often serve as stepping stones to get us to the goal, to get us to where we need to be. And Peter demonstrated this reality in a story found in the Gospel of Luke. If you can turn in your Bible, pick out your phones, whatever you use to access your Bible, Luke chapter 5, and come with me there because that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. I love, I love how you're not complaining about how warm it is in here. I love that. But if you get too warm, there's fans, move closer to their fans. There's a fan here that is not on. If you need to turn it on, turn it on. But I love your attitude this morning. Thank you. Luke chapter 5, you there? Let me tell you a little bit about the context before I read. The context is that as more and more people heard about Jesus and learned about Jesus, they looked for him and they followed him, literally, literally. He had a fan base greater than probably most famous people today. And they followed him wherever he went. There were so many people that Jesus didn't go to the synagogue very often anymore because he just had a lot of people following him. So he stayed in open places. He sought open fields where, where he could accommodate the thousands of people that surrounded him every day. In this instance, again, Several thousand people had come to hear what he had to say. The Bible says the people came to hear the word of God. And they were so eager to hear what he had to say that they were pushing him into the water. And Jesus saw, noticed two boats, and he got into one of them, and he asked the owner to push it into the water. And here it is, verse 1. We're going to go there. 
One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Verse 2, he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Verse 3, stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. Now, Simon, also called or also known as Peter, must have done it because it says that, that Jesus sat and he taught the crowds from there. But, but, you know, Peter could have said, look, man, I am busy cleaning my nets. Can't you see? Like, bug off. Or Peter could have said, man, I pulled an all-nighter. I'm tired. I need to go home and take a nap. Sorry. Or he could have said, listen, there's these... There's this boat. These, these, see those guys over there? Why don't you go talk to them? Maybe they'll let you use their boat. Or, or Peter could have just simply said, hey, man, get off my boat. Because you need to understand, it's like somebody jumping into the back of your pickup truck and saying, hey, can you move, can, can you move it to the top of the, of the hill for me? Which makes me ask this question, is my stuff available to Jesus? If Jesus jumped into my car, would my car be available to him? Or if Jesus said, hey, Fidel, can I use your house? Would I say, sure, here's the keys, use my house. Is your stuff available to Jesus? And notice that Jesus did not ask Peter, but rather he commanded. And Peter does not protest, but rather simply obeys. I see Peter and Jesus as making a great quarterback coach team. Jesus did not force Peter. And Peter had a choice. And he choose, chose to do what Jesus was asking of him. And I love this because Peter's obedience was a blessing to the noisy crowd who could now see Jesus better and could hear him better. There's a blessing for us and others when we do what God asks us to do. But here's the flip side of that. Just as our obedience to God blesses others, our disobedience brings pain and suffering to others. Isn't that true? Man, I have so many sad stories of moments and instances where, where I chose to say no to God and people suffered. But then there are other times when I chose to say yes to God and people were blessed. Do you have such experiences? Can you think of experiences in your life when you said yes and what happened afterward wasn't just a blessing for you, it was a blessing for others? So when Jesus asks you to do something, it's always in your best interest and for your benefit and the benefit of others. So ask yourself, how have I responded to the one thing God has asked me to do? Do you know what that one thing is? What is that one thing that God is asking you to do? He's been asking you for a while. Do this. And what is your response? Are you saying yes? Or are you saying, mm, it's too difficult. Mm, I don't have time. Um, I don't. I don't want to. And that's legit. You have a choice. You always have a choice. When it comes to God, God will always give you a choice. But I'm telling you, saying yes is so much sweeter. Verse 4, you with me? It says, when he had finished speaking, when he had finished teaching, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper, and let down your nets to catch some fish. And Simon responded, but master, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. Now, 
let's try and understand what's going on here for a little bit. Peter had just pulled an all-nighter. And not only that, but he had just finished cleaning his nets. And here is Jesus telling him, Peter or Simon, take your nets and throw them back into the water. But do you realize that if Simon throws them back into the water and doesn't catch anything, his nets are going to be what again? They're going to be dirty again. And what is he going to have to do? He's going to have to clean them again. Peter is a fisherman. He knows what he's doing. Jesus is not. And Peter knows that. Peter knows that Jesus is not a fisherman. And I don't know about you, but, but again, I don't like it when other people tell me how to do my job. Do you? I don't even like it when my wife comes and tells me how to wash the dishes. <laughs> but, but in all fairness, I'm very, very picky about how my, full, my clothes are folded. So, so sometimes I don't say anything anymore, or I just simply um, fold my own clothes. But, <laughs> but Peter is the expert here. This is his trait. He knows all the tricks there is to know. Peter is a generational and seasoned fisherman. Fishing is in his blood. His dad was a fisherman. His granddad was a fisherman. His great-granddad was a fisherman. And on and on and on for many generations. He knew his stuff. Have you ever worked or have you ever seen a tradesman work? Like an electrician, like a carpenter, like a mechanic, like a plumber. These guys know their stuff and they know their tools. And it's like an art to them. It's just, it's, it's beautiful watching them work. And this is who Peter is. He's a fisherman. He knows all the tricks and trades about fishing. But he's worked all night. He's tired. He's on empty, exhausted. And now Jesus is telling him to cast the net again. What would you have done? What would you have done? And truthfully, from my perspective, Peter has so many legitimate reasons why he can say no. And this is the thing about God. Sometimes God's instructions, sometimes God's directives make no sense. But God knows what he's doing. And sometimes we simply need to trust and obey. And this is where faith comes in. This is the second, the second time Jesus gives Peter a command. And because Peter has said yes the first time, I believe it was easier for him to say yes the second time. And notice that the first time command to push the boat out a little bit didn't take a lot of effort. But this second command is going to take a whole lot more effort because he has to go out there and cast the nets again. But understand that these are simply stepping stones for the third command that is about to come. Stay with me. Stay with me. Every time we say yes to Jesus. It sets, us, it sets us up for the next request of His. Several years ago, I went to a men's retreat in Arizona. And they were picking us up in a shuttle from the airport. And when I got off the plane and went outside, um, I. I read from the email where the shuttle was, so I went there to the shuttle, and when I got there, there was already several people inside the van. And when I got in, immediately, the Holy Spirit told me, introduce yourself to that guy. And there was a guy sitting in the back, and he looked uncomfortable, he looked out of place, and he looked a little scared. And my first reaction, because I'm hard-headed, I said, no, no, not this guy. 
not this guy. He's going to be like gum to my shoe. The moment I introduce myself to him, he's going to stick with me, and I'm not going to let be able to lose him all weekend. But after thinking about it for a little bit, I said, okay, I introduced myself. And, and it became uh, a beautiful friendship that lasted for many years. It was a friendship that benefited both him and I over many years. But that experience paved the way for the next time God asked me to introduce myself to complete strangers. And these complete strangers ended up living in my house for over a year. And again, it was a blessing not only to them, but to me. And here's what I'm trying to say. The Lord's requests often serve as stepping stones that lead to some of life's most wonderful blessings. Verse 5. Listen to Peter's humility and disposition. He says, but if you say so, I'll let the nets go down. This translation says, but at your word, I will let the nets go down. It's the same attitude that Mary had when the angel approached her. It's the same attitude that Noah had when God said, build the ark. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. But because you said it, I will do it. Imagine if every time Jesus came to you, you would say that. I don't get it. I don't feel like it. I don't have time. But because you said it, I will do it. How would your life change? How would your life be different if that was your response every time Jesus came to you? Peter chose to move in faith and leave the consequences to God. Is that how you live your life? You just act in faith and leave the consequences to God? By the way, what is faith again? Friends, what is faith? It's two things, remember? It's a belief plus a verb. What do you think Peter believed? What do you think Peter believed about this situation? Jesus is asking him, throw your nets. Peter had just been done fishing. He knows there's no fish out there. But what do you think happened inside of his mind, in his heart? What did he believe? That Jesus is God? Is that what I hear? Jesus is divine? Yeah. I, I, would, I would guess the same thing. And that's what moved him to do what Jesus was asking him to do. Just understand that all of Jesus' commands so far are for Peter's good. Jesus is leading him. And Jesus wants to deposit something good in Peter's life. But Peter has to obey first. And that's what I want you to take home with you. Jesus wants to deposit something good in your life. But you have to say yes first. You have to do that thing which Jesus is asking you to do first. Verse 6. And this time, it says, their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. Verse 7, a shout for help brought the partners in the other boats, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. There is success, friends, in obedience, isn't there? There is, there is victory in obedience to Jesus. There is, there is life in obedience. There is blessing in obedience. And look at Peter's response in verse 8. You with me? Verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees be before Jesus. What do we call this, friends? What do we call this? We've been learning. What do we call this? When somebody falls at the feet of Jesus or falls on their face before Jesus, what is it called? 
is called worship. Worship is a body posture. When we sing with all of our heart, we are praising. But when we get down on our knees or on our face or we lift up our hands in full surrender, that's called what? Worship. That's what we've been learning. Great. Worship. So verse 9, the catch is abnormal. And it says, verse 9, for he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Guys, they had been doing this all their lives, and they had never seen anything like this. And so here's the truth that you can put in your pocket. Our obedience to God to God's directives always benefits others. Peter's obedience helped the crowd see and hear Jesus, and it made his friends rich. I mean, they had a full, full boat of, of fish. That was probably enough fish to, to, to not go fishing for another month. When we obey God's directives, we bring blessing not only to ourselves, but to others. I was telling you about that, that other couple complete strangers that God asked me to introduce myself to. I did, and we began to uh, hang out a little bit. But within a couple of months after meeting them, they lost everything. They became homeless. So my wife and I were impressed by the Holy Spirit to allow them into our home. And so we, we brought them to our home. They began to live with us. And so I want you to understand that it's one thing to bring somebody into your house when you have an abundance, but it's another thing to bring somebody into your house and add two more mouths to feed, more electricity, more water. You get the deal if you pay bills. Um, that, that that's It's harder when you're barely making it, when you're when you're just like zeroing out every month. But we obeyed God's instruction. And what happened next is just nothing short of a miracle. My wife, within a week of them coming into our house, uh, ran into uh, a couple who had a, a food pantry or a food bank. And they were having leftover food. And so they didn't know what to do with it. So they gave it to my wife. And, and my wife brought home two boxes of food from Trader Joe's. And then next week, there was three boxes. The next week, there was five boxes. The next week, there was 12 boxes. And pretty soon, what just started as something like we thought it was going to be a short-lived, once-in-a-while thing, what, what happened shortly after that is the food bank was born in my kitchen. I think it was twice a week, right? Twice a week. We had people coming from everywhere to my house and picking up food. Um, and now that little ministry is a full-fledged food bank in Jacksonville where many people are being fed, and not only fed with food, but they're being fed with spiritual things. In fact, several baptisms have come in the last couple of years from that ministry. But my point is that when we obey God's directives, Great things happen. Amazing things happen. Verse 10, we're wrapping up here. Jesus says, don't be afraid. From, from now on, you will be fishing for people. Verse 11, and as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. According to Matthew and Mark, um, Matthew and Mark have this that Jesus invited Peter to follow him. He says, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Verse 20, and they left their nets in at, once, at once and followed him. So let's review here. Jesus did not ask Peter to do something difficult at first, did he? It was just push out the boat a little ways out. 
And then the next step was throw out your net again. And then the final step was come and follow me. He invited to take small steps of obedience and then they grew bigger and bigger. With every command, the effort increases, but so does the reward. And the last command to follow Jesus could never have been given if Peter hadn't listened to the first two, hadn't done the first two. Obedience to one command is a stepping stone to the next. Just like football, isn't it? One first down leads you to what? Another first down, and you go until you get to the, to the end zone to score and maybe win the game. If Peter had refused to throw out the net, he would not have received the miraculous catch, and he would not have been asked by Jesus to follow him. Here's the question for you. What qualified Peter to follow Jesus? Simple saying, yes, okay, I'll do it, I'll go, obedience. If you're spiritually stuck and not growing in Christ, if you can't seem to get a first down, go back to the last time you heard God's voice. Did you do it? Did you do what God asked you to do? If not, then you need to begin there. Because we grow when we do what Jesus asks, and we stop growing when we stop doing what Jesus is asking of us. We score touchdowns, we have wins, we have victories when we do what Jesus asks of us, and we lose when we don't. It's that simple. In the next chapter, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, I'm going to read this to you, just three verses. It says, Jesus is talking, and this is a question for all of us. It's a question for you. It's a question for me. And he's asking, he's saying, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's, what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against a house, it stands firm because it was well built. You hear what Jesus is saying? When you do, when you, when you do what I ask you to do, you are building your life on solid ground. You are building on a solid foundation. And when the storm comes and when life hits you with a crisis or a tragedy, you're going to be, you're going to be standing strong. You're not going to move. You're going to, you're, you're going to be solid. And this is 49. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Obedience to a single truth, to a single directive, to a single, single command, single request of Jesus is, is more vital to your growth and, than studying entire books and not doing anything about it. Imagine the kingdom of God growing because you obeyed a simple directive of Jesus. Imagine people experiencing freedom from sin in the peace of Christ, because you did what Jesus is asking you to do. We all need to be part of something greater than our selfish plans for comfort and more things. We all need to be part of a story that, that is larger than our wants and our desires and our whims. We all need our lives to have meaning and purpose. And that is achieved as we obey Jesus' directives. Jesus wants you to have success. Jesus wants you to experience wins in your life. Jesus wants you to have victory in your life. And that happens one act of obedience at a time.
Perhaps this is why he keeps asking you to do that one thing that he keeps coming to you about. He's building you up. He's setting you up one step at a time. Don't ignore him. Every act of obedience will bring blessing and rewards. Peter was invited to follow Jesus, as in literally leave everything and hit the road with him. Following Jesus is the beginning of a journey. It's the beginning of a relationship. I want to remind you that Jesus is inviting you to follow him today. No other master is wiser, is more patient, more loving, more kind, more, more merciful than Jesus. I've been following Jesus for several years now. And it has been amazing. And it has been challenging. Sometimes it's been hard. And it's been very, very worth it. I'm not the most obedient of his followers. I'm not the most obedient of his, of his disciples. But when I do, when I do obey, we, we get a first down every single time. We score touchdowns and we have wins. Jesus wants that for you. Jesus wants wins for you. But that can't happen if you're not willing to do what he's asking you to do. So I want to invite you this morning to commit to following Jesus today. Or maybe, like me, I need to recommit to following Jesus often because I'm such a hard-headed person sometimes. So will you do that today? Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you say, Jesus, I will follow you. Jesus, I will follow your directives. Jesus, I, will be, I won't be a hard-headed quarterback, but rather I will look to you to show me what to do and how to do it, and I will follow your directives. Can we stand as we pray and ask Jesus to guide us this, this new week, this new season of our lives? Let's bow our heads. Father God, here we stand we recognize your love in our lives. We, we have seen you in action in our lives. We have heard your voice. We have heard your directives. We've heard that still small voice. And today, Father, we, we say once again, I choose to follow Jesus. Can you say it, church? I choose to follow Jesus. If you've never done it before, it's the best thing that you could ever do. It's the best decision that you could ever make. And just say, I, Jesus, I, I choose to follow you. I choose to go after you. I choose to seek you. And if you've already been following Jesus, simply say, Jesus, I, I recommit my life to you today. Father, I pray that, that you will continue to touch each and every one of us. In Christ Jesus, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Before Mark comes up to give his last announcements, I want to remind you that we're going to be moving here in a couple of weeks. We want, we want to invite you to transition with us. As we transition, there's a few things that we're going to change. Um, it'll be uh, things to, to, to continue to help us to walk with Jesus, to grow us, and, and to be faithful followers of him. So I invite you to to think about uh, transitioning with us as we new, move to our new location in the next couple of weeks. After Mark gives his announcements, he's going he's gonna to invite the, the parents to take the children upstairs. And, and just want to remind you that we're going to have a discussion about what we talked about. We're going to talk about um, being a follower of Jesus and what that looks like, uh, obeying Jesus and what that looks like. And we're going to do that over here in about 10 minutes. We're going to do it in this room over here. And if you want to hang out and catch up with old friends, do that. St hang out, stick around, or just go to this side of the room, okay? Um, and make sure that you say hello to somebody that you've never said hello to. Mark, can you close us off? Hello?
Pastor, the church is happy that you are healed up from your foot. And you're not wearing a boot anymore. So we thank God for that. Um, as Pastor said, in two week, three weeks, three Sabbaths from now, actually, three Sabbaths from now, we will be worshiping at the um, Grow Life Church. Uh, and there is the address, and the time will be the same, right? Pastor, the time is the same. They only change the address. So that's the address on March, first Sabbath of March, March 2nd, right? Uh, March 2nd is our first Sabbath there. Please make plans to join us. It's a transition for us, and uh, God is leading us, is leading us through this, uh, um, this moving to that church. Uh, also, I'd like to invite you to uh, follow our uh, newsletter. Would be great because that's where we keep all the information relative to our church. So anything that changes, anything that happens, goes straight to the newsletter. It comes once a week, every Friday morning. So please make sure to sign up for that. Just point your cameras and, and make sure to uh, uh, have the QR code direct you to the newsletter sign up. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, have a prayer for you as we dismiss, and the children can, the parents can take the children to the elevator, and uh, then we're going to have an intermission of uh, about five minutes, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for the message of uh, Pastor Soto, and, and as we, O Lord, transition to the second portion of this time with you, uh, we pray your blessings on our children. And also, oh Lord, as uh, um, the adults are going to talk about the, the sermon subject, we pray your blessings for the new week that is beginning tonight, and we praise and kindly ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, children, welcome to go to with the parents, and uh, we're going to have intermission of five minutes. <laughs> 